Oh, I want to take a second. So for this chapter, I structured it so I had for each subsection a different folder. Like this is the 8.1 files and then 8.2 files. And that worked out pretty well for me. I know we're like right at the end of this course. Um, but I guess if I had to redo it again, that's probably how I would uh, restructure it. Just because then I could have all the files and when they get updated for next section, I have all my previous ones that don't change. Um, and I found in this chapter, there's all these files everywhere that are trying to call from different locations. And that was a pain to get working in Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know if anyone else had that issue. Um, I haven't done that a lot, so maybe I went about it the wrong way, but this kind of uh, resolved it for me. Yeah, I like um, that's such a good idea. <laughs> yeah. The file management was really tough. <laughs> yeah. So especially as he said, I'm working like in Jupyter, uh, running uh, files <laughs> or like uh, um, the py files. So this is a cool idea, I guess. Yeah. Um, can you yeah, tell it... about the font size of the Jupyter? Um, oh, your screen, yes. just the screen, because it's more like my <laughs> eyes. Um, I'm not sure I know how to do that. Oh, 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 your screen command plus oh, command plus that work. Command plus is that better? I mean, that's too big. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, there yes, we go. cool. Yes, there we go. Um, so th this chapter is on uh testing, debugging, um, and logging, and so the first section is on testing. So it starts out with uh, testing rocks, debugging sucks. Uh, the dynamic nature of uh, Python makes testing critically important for most applications. There is no compiler to find your bugs. Uh, the only way to run the code is to run the code and make sure you try all its features, which is pretty similar to how R works. Um, and we're used to that, but it's not similar to how if you code it in uh, C++ or anything or C Sharp, um, that it's a uh, you have to run it through the compiler so it checks a lot of stuff for you. Whereas in Python, it just goes and you hope for the best. Um, but I think it's easier to program. So I like that. So uh, the first thing they talk about is assertions. Um, and you can use the assert statement is an internal check for the program. If an expression is not true, it raises an assertion error exception. Um, and then I don't know why these are hidden. There we go. Um, so you see this example where it's assert and expression, and then you give it the message. So for example, we have assert, then you use is instance 10, comma int. So you're saying is 10 an instance of integer or int, and then it should be expected int. Um, and so this shouldn't be used to check user input, like if you're entering on a web form. Um, its purpose is more for internal checks and invariants, uh, so conditions that should always be true. Then we have contract programming, also known as design by contract. Uh, liberal use of assertions is an approach for designing software. It prescribes that software designers should define precise interface specifications for the components of the software. Uh, so for example, you might put assertions on all inputs of a function. So in this example, you have the add function and you wanna make sure that each input is an integer. And so you can assert it for each time. And checking inputs will immediately catch callers who aren't using appropriate arguments. So I think I can run these. Um, I don't know how to my run command. Am I just missing it? Um, I think it's um under uh markdown. You can change the source to uh, code. I think right. Um, so under this um 
No, here. Uh, right here. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can copy that and paste it, maybe. Oh. <laughs> Uh, let me close out this file and then reopen it. Yeah, because it works for the Quarto. Um, yeah. Um, do you select the interpreter? Uh, because like... Uh, where is the interpreter like? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, I don't know. I've never had this happen. Because um, it's always just uh work for me. Uh it works for me too. Um but it's QMD. Oh, okay. Oh, right, go ahead. Run those cells. Or... Um. Yeah, I can run these cells. Let me try. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Is it in like the wrong mode? Um, ah, okay. Can you go a little bit up? Yeah. Um, so here, it, um, okay. So here you can see here where you have this row, um, I think you need to specify what you want to run. Like, is it Python or whatsoever? Um, do you understand what I mean? Um, I guess, but I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, yes. Because like I said, normally when I convert it over, it just... Yeah, um, so you need to say Jupyter. Dash. Um, so if you look at this guy, um, share this. If you look at them, if you look at it, uh, the Quattro um, BS code page, you can see like, is it, um, you can see you need to put Jupyter, then you say Python 3. You, space, you need to specify the. Um, like in a terminal? No, 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 not in the... In the YAML. YAML. At the top, yeah. Oh. Oops. Does that work? Yeah, that's what I got in here. And then it should convert it over here. It's got Python right here. Yeah, maybe oh, you can try. Does it matter that it says eval is false? In the game? Let me take that. That's what I had that because when I was doing it in Porto, you had these ones that don't work. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, just the way they look. And so I turn that off every time. Um, and then when I convert it over to Jupyter Notebooks, it worked. But I don't know why it's not doing it now. Um. Uh -huh. hmm. uh -huh. um, I guess we just use a Quarto, but I really don't know. Um.
Oh, okay. You change it to quattro. Okay. Uh, two files. There's a okay quarter document and then Jupyter notebook. And so far, what I'm doing is I write up in quarto so I get the markdown, and I just have being converted to Jupyter notebooks. Hmm. And that's worked every time. So maybe if I close it all down and restart. Yeah, maybe. Um, what I don't know, like um, uh, in your uh, uh, Jupiter, I cannot see like uh, you choose the um your Python interpreter. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about, but. I've only ever set that when I ran the code, it would ask me then. So I don't know how to set it. Okay. Okay. From the beginning. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So this yes. is what I'm talking uh, about. I, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it came back. I don't know what happened. I just closed it all down, then opened it back up, and it's working fine now. That's great. So I don't know. It's kind of uh, weird. But I guess at the MCU, that's what you should do. Uh, but yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about with the interpreter. Because um, this is what it'll do. Like I can select which one, and that's the right one. But I don't know how to get this set up when it was. Because normally what happens is uh, when I hit the run button, then it'll just a keyboard, I guess. Um, oh, so in this example, you got the assert. And so every time you run the add function, it checks that the inputs are both integers. Um, and so in here, you see that works. But in this one, it doesn't because two and three are strings and not integers. Uh, so it's a good way to make your code a lot tougher. Um, then the next section is inline test. Yeah. So I have a question. So, okay. um, just like um, uh, um, for example, if I'm writing uh, some kind of data analysis stuff, do I need to do this kind of testing? Now, uh, or in which way should we use code with a lot of because <laughs> this will take like a lot of time to write everything with test. What do you think, guys? I think I would only do it if I'm writing functions, like if you're making a package and you want to check that everything's working in there. I think if I have like a more okay. like a pipeline for like a markdown report, probably mm -hmm. want to use it. I guess if you had um like people have like yeah. interfaces with Shiny, my I have not used a lot of Shiny, so I don't know if that's a true statement, but I could see that being a situation. Yeah. Uh Mostly use this in, in the context of packages um, and adding tests for the various functions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, then assertions can also be used for simple tests. Um, this, so you see here, you're just testing that it works. Uh, this way you are including the test in the same module as your code. Um, and the benefit is if the code is obviously broken and attempts to import the module will crash. And it's not recommended for exhaustive testing. It's more of a basic smoke test. Does the function work on any example at all? If not, then something is definitely broken. Um, and then the, that's probably the biggest part of this section as the unit test module. And suppose we have some code where we have the add function that just returns the two inputs that are added together. And now we want to test it. You can create a separate testing file like this, um, then defining a testing class. The testing class must inherit from the unit test dot test case. Uh, and in the testing class, you define the testing methods. And so we have our uh, test add class and we're well, first we gotta import um, from unit test, but then it uses inherent from the unit test dot test case, uh, which is a nice callback to the previous chapters. Um, and then in each one, there's a method that tests um, different things you want to test. So here we have 
uh, test simple and it just as to see if it works. Um, and then this one, you have integers and strings. I think that should be a four. Um, but this code doesn't run in Jupyter Notebooks like this, I think. Well, I don't know. Um, but each method must start with a test. Oh, um, this just it's like saves it. It doesn't actually run it. We'll do that in a second. Uh, so using unit test, uh, there are several built-in assertions that come with unit test. Each of them asserts a different thing. So you have ones that assert if something's true, if two things are equal, two things are not equal, and two things are almost equal. And that's good if you've got some um, mathematical calculations uh, just dealing with floating points um, and things that can um, raise exceptions. And this is not an exhaustive list. There are other assertions in the module. So for running unit test, uh, to run the test, turn the code into a script. And so you basically take what we had in this cell and you move down here and then you put um, e, use the Dunder method's name and main. And then you run Python uh, just sample. And, oh, and then this um, where you have a five, but it's adding two and two. So it should be four. And it can grow to be quite complicated for large applications. The unit test module has a huge number of options related to test runners, collection of results, and other aspects of testing. You can consult the documentation for details. And then third party test tools that built in unit test module has the advantage of being available everywhere as part of Python. However, many programs also find it to be quite verbose. A popular alternative is PyTest. With PyTest, your testing file simplifies to something like the following. So it's just a lot shorter. Um, to run the test, you simply type a command such as Python hyphen m PyTest. It will discover all the tests and run them. Uh, there's a lot more to PyTest in this example, but it's usually pretty easy to get started should you decide to try that out. And then we have the exercises. Um, and this exercise will explore the basic mechanics of using Python's unit test module. In earlier exercises, we wrote a file that stock.py that contains a stock class for this exercise. Also using code ran for exercise 7.9 involving type properties. Um, you can just copy from the solutions if you don't have it. So for here, we'll write a unit test for the stock class to get started. There is a small fragment of code that has instance creation. So you start this um, pound, which is in the other file, and you have your test class. And it inherits from unit test.test case, and each of the methods test something. So for here, it tests the create. And then at the end, you got the if the one score name equals main. And then, so when you run this file, it'll run all the test. Um, and so to see this file, you can go here. And so the original stop one, um, if you don't remember, was basically a class that had name, shares, price, and then some methods that you could turn the cost or you could sell, which would subtract out what you're trying to sell. And then the test file looks like this. Um, you need the heading at the top. And then this is from the example where we test if we create a stock class with GU 100 uh, 49.1. You put everything in there, does it equal? I said so this just tests um, the creation. And then we test if s.cost property returns the correct value. And so here it should be these two numbers multiplied together. So you get here and then here. And then for here, we test if the cell method decrements the shares accordingly. 
And so you create it and then you sell 25 and here to be 100 minus 25 goes to 75. Make sure that SR shares is not a non negative or not a non integer value. Sorry. And so for each of these, um, it should raise an error. And you can test it uh, here if you're using uh, Jupyter Notebooks. If you use a magic run command, so just first inside a run to call it, and as long as this file's in the same folder as um, the test underscore stock file, it'll run through all the tests. So you see here, yeah, four tests and it ran in no time. And so all that worked out. And but you play around with it, um, see if you wanted something. So like if this was 70. It'll run, and then it'll give your assertion error that 75 is not equal to 70, so you can go figure out um, where the error is. Uh, does that make sense to everyone? Are there any questions? No, I'm OK. Yeah, thank you. Then we can move on to the next section. Uh, for 8.2. And so for this one, it uh, this section briefly introduces the logging module. So the logging module is a standard library module for recording diagnostic information. It's also a very large module with a lot of sophisticated functionality. And we'll show a simple example to illustrate its usefulness. Uh, so we're going to go back to the exceptions revisited. So in the exercises, we wrote a function parse that looks something like this, um, where basically you try to parse a file um, and then you have this accept value or accept value error um, if it couldn't work. And so we're going to focus on the try accept statement. What should you do in the accept block? And he asks, should you print a warning message? And so for here, you print can not parse the line number and the reason with the error, or you could silently ignore it um, if you wanted to do that. I think I copied these two down the same way. Um, so I think that's off a little bit. But neither solution is satisfactory because you often want both behaviors and you want it to be user selectable. So the logging module can address this um, where if we, We'll cover this in a second. Um, the code is modified to issue warning messages or a special logger object. Uh, the one created with logging dot get logger um, underscore underscore name underscore underscore. Uh, so you can see that up here, and then you can use the logging object. So for our logging basics, create a logger object. So this is just log equals logger dot get logger name and you can issue log messages. Um, each method represents a different level of security. I mean, severity, sorry. Uh, all of them create a formatted log message. Args is used with the percent site operator to create the message. Um, and so you just put them together and it's written to the log. We have logging configuration. The logging behavior is configured separately. Um, when you do this in the main method, Typically, this is a one-time configuration at program startup. The configuration is separate from the code that makes the logging calls. Uh, logging is highly configurable. You can adjust every aspect of it, output files, levels, message formats, et cetera. However, the code that uses logging doesn't have to worry about that. So it's uh, separated out, which is really nice. And so for the exercise for this section, uh, we're going to add logging to a module in the file parse.py, there are some error handling related to exceptions caused by bad input. It looks like this. Um, so this is where we try to parse a CSV. And down here is where we kind of looked at before where we can convert and we have a reason. So 
when you notice a print statement that issue diagnostic messaging, replace those prints with logging operations is relatively simple. You change the code like this. Um, so we add in the logging information at the top. And then down here, instead of just using our normal prints, we use a log.warning and log.debug. And now we made these changes, try using uh, some of the code on bad data. So I think I've made those changes. Let me try this. Yeah. Um, if you do nothing, you only get logging information for the warnings level and above. The output will look like simple print statements. Or if you configure the logging module, you'll get additional information about logging levels, modules, and more. Type these steps to see that. And then here you can see we've added it in. And so we get the additional like warning file par parse. And so it tells you what file is being used because up here it's just the report um, file, but this tells you is all the way in the file parse. So that's nice. And you will notice that you don't see the output from log.debug operation. Type this to change the level. And then I can't really get these two things. Uh, turn off all but the most critical log messages, this one and this one. Uh, to give me the uh, output from to match that what was in uh, the book. I didn't know if anyone else had that issue or if you could get it to work uh, because I got pulled up on my other window, which is what you hear the strong for. Um, these should look a little different. But I don't know. If anyone else had that. Um, but mostly because they should say like, well, this is warning. Well, that's what I was supposed to say, but I can never get the debug to work. But I think it might be because I'm using Jupyter Notebook and something's getting lost in there. Um, yeah, and I guess if I was, it. yeah, I think if I was doing a whole debugging program, I wouldn't be using Jupyter mm -hmm. Notebook. Uh, yeah. so that's kind of what I left it on. Yeah. Yeah, also using oh. Jupyter Notebooks, which I know in the first chapter he was like, "Don't use <laughs> Jupyter." Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You said, don't use Jupiter, not do it. Okay, cool. I thought it was probably with that, but I don't know if, if anyone else could get working because I had to move all the files around to get this to work right. Um, but I just kind of left it. So um, I'm good with. Oh, are there any questions for me to the next part? No, for me. I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, then we can. I guess, like in uh, data analysis world, have you ever used logging? I've never uh, logged anything. I've read logs, but never written them. Um, I've never used like an actual logging program. I do a lot of what we'll cover in the next section with just print statements and step by step through code, which isn't like like cool programming, but it works pretty well for me. Uh, but I've never had to do super advanced stuff with creating a package uh, that I can just figure out from there. And yeah. I guess, well, I've done some logging stuff um, with SQL oh. where we had to keep track of information, um, but it wasn't like this. It's just more about writing stuff to tables. Got it. Well, thank you. All right, and then this is the last section, um, so on debugging. And so uh, debugging tips. So your program is crashed, and this is what it might look like. We have all the error messages that go all the way through. And so now what? Uh, reading tracebacks, the last line is the specific call set crash. So it's down here at the bottom. Um, however, it's not always easy to read or understand. Uh, so pro tip is paste the whole traceback into Google. And I 
<laughs> so we just copy the whole trace back and paste it in Google. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I've never yeah. done that with R, or if I have it, normally doesn't really return good results. Um, I'm a lot of times so if I like pull it apart, I take out like all the different lines and stuff, it'll help out. Um, or just get the error and then like whatever package I'm using, it'll help out. Um, but yeah, maybe that's, I guess that's just different in Python or something, or maybe it's just more common um, for that situation to occur. Uh, then we have using REPL, uh, you use the option hyphen I to keep Python live when executing the script. Um, and so in this little example, you still got the um, carrots that show it. Uh, it preserves the interpreter state. This means you go back and poke around after a crash, checking variable values in other states. Um, R is kind of native in doing that. And I think so is uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And so it's, this is not, um, this is really helpful if you're doing uh, different files and things like that. But if you're in Jupyter Notebooks or R, um, it's not. But I've done other programming languages where it's a pain because you can't see what happened right before you got the error. It just ends, then everything gets erased. And so this is very valuable when you need it. Debugging with print. Uh, print debugging is quite common. Uh, tips to make sure you use the wrapper. And so for here, um, you can print debug and it'll give you information on the spam method. Um, um, but why do you say do we use this uh, method? Um, uh, it gives you an accurate representation of a value, uh, not the nice printing output. Um, and so I guess it shows you uh, in this example, if you print X, it just puts 3.4. But if you use the rubber, it tells you it's the whole uh, class is 3.4 string. And so it tells you if there's any differences, um, which I know I've had issues before um, with print when there's like a number that's a string and they look the same and you can't really see a difference. Or like with white space at the front or the back of something. Um, so I can see where that would come in handy. I probably would just do print at the beginning by accident, and then maybe for into this issue, that would switch to that. Um, so it's probably a nice tip to know about, but I bet I forget it. Does that make sense? Yeah, OK, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it just tells you more information. Um, the Python debugger, I'm oh, sorry, I'm closest. Um, you can maybe launch the debugger inside a program. Um, so you can have breakpoints where enter the debugger in Python 3.7 and up. This starts the debugger at their breakpoint call. In earlier Python versions, you did this. I think it's supposed to be if you did this, you'll sometimes see this mentioned in other debugging guides um, where it's use a PDB in set trace, a set breakpoint. Um, to run under debugger, you can also run an entire program under debugger um, with this command. It will automatically enter the debugger before the first statement, allowing you set breakpoints and change the configuration. Uh, some common debugger commands are help, wear down, et cetera. And you can just move through, if you have a complicated um, application, you can see what's going on at different levels. And for breakpoints location, uh, it's one of the following. So you can do a line, line out file, or uh, different functions. And then there are no exercises for a section. Um, I think I, I don't know if any of y'all have used the debugger in our studio. I've tried it out before, but I've never really had a lot of experience with it. Yeah, same here. I know it exists, <laughs> but I don't really use it. Yeah, every time I think I need, I'm willing to figure out what the issue is. But I don't tend to write super complicated 
packages. So I don't think I've ever like really needed it, needed it. Um, but it is pretty cool. I've seen, I think, like YouTube talks on it. Uh, so it always seems neat, but I never get to that point. And then that is all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, today the chapter is short. Yeah, so we uh, are the last chapter um, packages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know um, how to, um, but uh, this is my first time to look into packages in Python. And uh, yeah, I hope it's going to be like some place thing as well. Um, yeah. So next week, we will discuss packages. That's the last chapter. And maybe we can, the next book will be Python for data analysis. Um, they, they even finished the whole draft version of the book because Previously, when we started this book, I think they released only seven chapters, first seven chapters, but now the complete chapters, 11 or 12 chapters, they are ready. And uh, yeah, we will be ready to dive in and start looking at the Python for data analysis. Cool. Yep. So that's what we have today. Um, if there is nothing to talk, um, I think uh, we meet next week, uh, next week, same time. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you, Isabel. Um, thank you for the help today. And thank you, Taylor, for the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.